colloquially colloquially known. Um, cost accounting is a method to limit the amount of computation that any one agent can um, submit to the platform um, without incurring some sort of cost. Um, so, yeah, that's a problem because rolling is turned complete. So someone could issue a deployment uh, with a contract that just runs forever, eating up um, minor resources. And um, it was actually Turing's idea um, the first time to to limit computation to meter it based on you know just integers a well founded set or something. But um, I think uh, Ethereum popularized it in the blockchain space. So this cost accounting framework is similar to Ethereum's gas. Um, and the portion that we are trying to check into the code base now is the portion that um, charges a proportional amount of gas from, um, or amount of rev from the deployer's associated vault. Um, so this links Casper um, wallets and, um, well, quote, cost accounting. So I'm not doing this on Node yet. We haven't quite gotten that far. Um, but this should do just to demonstrate the sort of behavior that we should expect out of the framework. Um, <clears throat> here I have a little test network set up. Um, um, I guess I'll just go line by line on this. Um, yeah, so on line 39, we have a public key for our, um, that's supposed to represent the Genesis user. So it's a public key, um, but, but effectively like any other user. Um, and yet another user, just in case we need the flexibility, a program that we're gonna pull into a deployment, that deployment here using that program. And then a set of terms that are deployed uh, in the Genesis block. So these are built-in terms. There, you can think of them kind of like libraries, um, although some serve, you know, are pretty crucial to the operation of the platform. For example, um, this is the Casper contract. Um, uh, this, <laughs> on the other hand, is just a contract uh, that's a collection of operations on lists, um, although necessary. Um, on negative number is a contract guaranteeing um, that a number that we're trying to um, deduct never goes negative. Make mint is the contract that mints rev um, and controls access to purses. Again, the proof of stake contract here. Off key is an authorization um, sort of interface for um, object capabilities. Um, rev fault here. Um, this is the contract that allows users the sort of higher level interface, uh, the direct interface between vaults, so where they store their rev exactly. Uh, rev generator here, uh, we just need this to actually uh, create the initial vaults. Um, and you'll see here that we're starting with um, one vault um, for our user. So this is a user's public key. And the initial balance of that user is balance, which we defined above as the maximum possible value um, that is an integer. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm gonna do here is go through a couple of different scenarios. Um, let me... Um, so to start out, let's... Um, actually, let me tell you a little bit more about how the pricing works. Um, so in order to represent cost in an execution environment in an efficient way, um, we have this idea of a uh, um, flow price and flow is equivalent to Ethereum's gas on our chain. Um, and f uh, the flow price is the amount um, of flow, I believe, per rev, yeah, times no, yeah, yeah. It's the number of rev uh, that each unit flow costs. Um, and this is just going to be multiplied effectively by um, yeah, the cost of the program to determine the equivalent amount in rev that the program has to cost. So the point is that a user should run a program um, 
we should measure how uh, complex it is, and then they should be charged for that complexity. So let's try deploying this tiny little program, um, which just sends the integer two on the quoted channel or the quoted process one. We're going to deploy this program, um, initializing the balance of our user um, to the highest possible value. We're going to make them rich. Uh, the flow limit uh, is, uh, again, the highest possible value that you could choose, which effectively means that um, since each flow represents like a small uh, little uh, step of computation, um, a flow limit that is a maximum value uh, represents a, a computation that doesn't terminate anytime soon. Um, so, and then of course the flow price, we're saying that um, each unit of gas causes, um, or flow costs us zero rev. So this is a free computation that potentially runs uh, for, uh, for a long period of time. And we're doing this just so I can demonstrate how much this guy would cost in terms of flow. I think SBT may have fallen asleep. No. There you go. Cool. Okay. Um, so all these print statements are uh, different points in the execution of our tiny little program here. Um, let's just go through these. Um, and see what is going on. Um, the first thing uh, that we'll see, um, yeah, that we'll notice is that the Genesis vault is being instantiated. Genesis vault, obviously the vault that is endowed with the full quantity of rev uh, in the Genesis block. Um, so we're instantiating that vault. We're transferring a certain amount of rev um, from the Genesis vault to the user vault. So it starts in the genesis and it ends up in this user's um, vault, corresponding vault. Um, we are then instantiating user vault. And this is, I guess, a point that Artur brought up a couple weeks ago about how we get this uh, cool ability. To, uh, well, I guess it's just a result of the sort of the compositionality of Rolang, which is that since we write programs out of concurrency primitives almost exclusively. Um, and concurrency, you know, is useful for expressing things that are order independent. When we write a bunch of small contracts in terms of concurrent primitives, our larger contracts also exhibit the same sort of order independent behavior. So I can, yeah, I can transfer to a user, for example, before that user even has a vault and that's valid behavior on the platform. Um, the next thing that happens is that the proof of stake contract is instantiated. Um, we finish that instantiation. And the there's, yeah, the, the obvious question, I guess, would be when a user pays for a contract, where does it go? Um, their payment goes into the proof of stake contract, um, which is, and that all those payments that are collected are eventually distributed among the validators, which is part of the val validator rewards um, program that we're working on. Um, yeah, so these represent effectively all of the contracts that we need to, um, to transact. After we have those, we're gonna start evaluating our contract. And during evaluation, uh, we'll notice the first thing that happens is um, is that we compute the user's balance. Um, and the reason that we're gonna do this is, I guess, actually just you know, because of um, rate limiting's intention, which is to um, yeah, prevent against resource attacks. So the first thing that we're gonna do is check the user's balance. If the user does not have enough rev in their vault to cover the maximum case, um, 
uh, the maximum potential cost of the program, then the deployment is rejected outright. Um, in this case, the maximum cost of the program is the um, is equal to flow price times flow limit, which is equal to zero, um, which means that, of course, we do have enough uh, rev in our vault because we have all the rev at this point. <clears throat> so now that our balance is sufficient to cover the cost of the computation, um, we see a few internal operations that happen uh, just to get the vaults in line. Um, so the first meaning that we have to find the contract that uh, effectively gives us access to vaults, that's the vault, um, rev vault instance. Then we have to find the user's vault. And then once we've successfully found the user's vault, we can query for the user's balance, which again is a max value. We then determine how much we're, we're gonna have to pay for the deploy. Um, and as I mentioned above, the amount that um, the, well, actually no, this is something else, yeah. So since a contract may not uh, use all of the uh, flow that it purchases, um, we have to do something with the remainder. Um, we can't just, yeah, we can't just pocket it. So the remaining flow that's not used in the execution is refunded back to the user. Um, meaning that the amount that we see here is going to be the actual cost of the program. In this case, no matter what we, no matter how long the program runs, it's always gonna be zero. Then we see we call into the proof of stake contract to pay it. Uh, we finish paying it. Um, and then we finish evaluating the contract. And what we want to determine now is that after running the contract, we see the um, balance of the deployer reduced by the corresponding cost of their contract. And in this case, that's zero. So in this case, the user balance shouldn't change, and it doesn't. Any questions so far? Cool. Now let's do something that is a little bit more realistic. Mm, and I actually don't remember how much this one costs, so we'll have to see. Um, but based on, yeah, just based on these numbers, we, uh, you know, a small contract like this and a large balance like that, where each flow costs just one rev, um, it, we should certainly not see um, that, uh, yeah, any sort of errors uh, due to running out of flow. Although I'll show you, I'll show you one of those next. So. Implicit numeric widening. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let's look at this again. As we saw before, we have our Genesis contracts above, um, our contract evaluation here, and it looks like the user's balance is correctly computed to be 500, while the contract itself is uh, computed at 33 rev. So that is actually 33 flow times one rev per flow. Um, so what we should see is that 5,500 is deducted by 33 when we pay for the contract. 
And that is what we see. Um, <clears throat> so the question, um, I guess there, there's still a question of what happens uh, during, what happens to a program if the program runs out of flow or if the program throws any sort of error for that matter. Um, in that case, we still want uh, to enforce um, rate limiting. So we still need to, we still need to disincentivize sending programs that for example, are just gonna terminate. So we still charge the user for the amount of rev that is consumed up to the point that the contract uh, throws the error. However, uh, once the contract throws the error, all of its effects, um, aside from the payment, are, um, are reversed. So, this one should be more expensive. Um, I think that'll be enough, actually. So what I'm going to do here So this bit of the contract is going to be pretty expensive. Um, and I'm going to try to provide a amount of flow that is low enough to where this contract will run out. Um, and when contracts run out of flow, they throw an error and they stop going. And then, yeah, we just charge what we can for, for the amount of, uh, for the amount of uh, flow that the user has purchased. So we should see an error and then more green. Okay, one test failed. Should be well, let's see what's going on here. Um, so, yes, all the same stuff. Um, we compute the user's balance to be 200. And then immediately, it seems the computation runs out of flow, um, which is cause for terminating the contract, hence the red. Um, so we continue, we continue. We start to pay for um, the deploy and it looks like the um, contract actually accumulated 282 flow and that's probably something to do with the size or atomicity of particular operations. Um, if one operation costs uh, much more than other operations in the language, um, then it's possible that you, um, yeah, you, that you could throw an out of flow error for something that is higher, uh, and stop at something that's higher than the maximum that you that you set. Um, and we can do all sorts of things to minimize those occurrences. Um, so what we should see, yes, um, and actually. In this case, we're seeing that when we try to pay the proof of stake account, um, that we uh, have insufficient funds. And this is actually not expected behavior. So I guess it's a good thing that uh, we're seeing it now. Um, the point being, I suppose, that, um, and, and the reason I guess why this happened is because obviously we have a balance of 200 in our contract through. Um, uh, 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 or consume 282 flow and one flow per rev is too little too late. Um, yeah. And so this one's kind of backwards. We'll certainly have to investigate that one. Um, that of the insufficient funds error, however, um, should, uh, is actually, is actually, I suppose, uh, something else to demonstrate. Um, Or did I already show that? That's what you just demonstrated, Joe. But, well, yes, no. and that's what you were hoping. That's what you were hoping to demonstrate here, but we ran into the the new issue. Which is really well, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, 
Right. So let's see. Let me try something. Well, it actually brings up an important point, um, which is that people need to be aware that when they're doing resource planning in the concurrency setting, there's lots and lots of non-determinism. So when you're, when you're doing this kind of planning, you have to consider max branches, min branches, and these kinds of things, as opposed to thinking that you're going to have um, a one-size-fits-all price, because it won't work. Um, and it's literally the cost of doing business in the concurrency setting. <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, um, I mean, one of the things that you pointed out at the beginning is there's some cool stuff in the sense that Rolang allows you to do dependency-based computing. So it's it's not that it's order insent- insensitive. It's it's rather that you can park a computation waiting on a dependency. So when this dependency is satisfied or arrives at this channel, then we can continue the converse, the, the computation. Um, and uh, and so you can you can do things in what appears to be an out of order fashion. In fact, it's not out of order. It's that you're enforcing the order by setting up chains of dependencies. Um, and and on the flip side of it is, is of course, since things are coming in in orders that are not necessarily determined, <laughs> cost estimation becomes a little bit more subtle. Yeah, and and uh, the and I suppose that the the crux of the uh, the matter in that in the last example is that um, yeah well well yeah a couple things like you're saying Greg so concurrency issues are one um, so that contract wasn't itself non deterministic um, but um, writing a sort of a, a rate limiting harness for concurrent language. Also, uh, we also also have to consider uh, some, yeah, like issues um, issues around parallelism. Um, so what we've seen before, and uh, something that we we're, we're getting a, a good handle on, is that when one thread um, of a total of a when one thread of the computation runs out of flow because uh, locally uh, out, of a, out of a central reservoir of flow, um, then we have to make sure that all of the, all of the threads stop. Um, and doing that simultaneously is, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. I, uh, so, but, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> there are uh, things that we're looking into.